Hi there, I'm Anne Marie Mahoney, your host on Belmont Journal. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing our local author, Greg Stone, about his book, Danger Dangerous Inspiration. Greg, welcome. Thank you. I've read the whole book. Okay. I'm very excited to talk about it with you. Okay. Um, and I hope that our viewers get as excited as I do. Let's start with the basics. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you got into writing something like this. Well, a bit about my background. I spent many years as a journalist. I was a writer at Time Inc. in New York and I was a TV reporter and I've had my own communications business for 30, almost 35 years now. But what happened with this mystery, I'd written a couple of business books and I had some rather serious back surgery in 2019. Oh dear. And I was doing fine after the surgery, came home, and then I had a complication and I had to go back into the hospital. And I was actually in intensive care for a few days and drugged out of my mind. Oh, so no. my wife would be where you are and I would turn over and start talking to somebody over here. And she would say, who are you talking to? I'd say, I'm talking to, I'm talking to, I'm talking to. I don't know who I'm talking uh -oh. to. And I was reading a mystery book at the same time and I couldn't really concentrate on it, so I closed my Kindle and put it down. Then I started imagining what was happening next, thinking that that's what was next in the book. But then I realized that I was imagining it from my head. And then I thought, you know, maybe I can write a mystery. And so when I came out of it, that's what happened. I tried my hand at it, and here we are. And here we are. All right. That's excellent. Um, so would it be fair for me to characterize your book as... Agatha Christie meets Ruth Ware in Vermont. I love it. As I mentioned, you know, I love Agatha Christie. To me, she is the giant. I've read tons of her work. I think she was an absolute genius, and there's nobody better. In fact, the Bible, Agatha Christie, and J.K. Rowling are the three Best sellers of all time. I think it's something like 500 million of her books have sold, and they're in hundreds of languages. Exactly, and you know the characters are indelible. You got Hercule Poirot, you got Jane Marple. You know, people are either Jane Marple people or they're Hercule Poirot people. I like them both, Me too. but she always holds your interest, and she's very clever. The plots are just so clever. Right. Okay. All right. Well, good inspiration. Let's go for a minute with the Vermont piece. Okay. Why did you choose Vermont as your setting? And tell us a little bit about the whole idea of the artist colony. Well, I've always been fascinated with artist colonies. I said to my family a few years back, I said, you know, I think I might want to go and hang out in an artist colony if I can get in, but I'm afraid that you guys would miss me. And they're like, no, 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 it's fine, Dad. <laughs> go ahead. See ya. Yeah, see you later. <laughs> But I never got around to it, and we've done a lot of skiing up in the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont, which is, the, people say it's a place where, where the, the residents are quite eccentric. I'm not sure that's true, but it's beautiful, it's unspoiled. And so I was kind of familiar with that area, and I thought it'd be an interesting place to set the mystery. And then I invented this artist colony and the, the family who run it, as you know, and took it from there. I think you've latched on to the eccentric piece with yeah. some of your characters. I hope so. Um, oh, definitely. Um, tell us a little bit about how you create these characters, or do you have inspiration that you draw on for them? Because there's many. You know, there's a lot of characters, and as we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. that's hard to do, to create all those people and make them realistic. Exactly. I think, uh, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on fiction writing, but I did do a lot of screenplays and teleplays, only one of which was produced. That's a whole other story. But you have to put yourself aside when you're writing. What a lot of people do, when I was in high school, I was on the literary magazine, and we used to call it adolescent crisis poetry. <laughs> you know, kids would write about their adolescent crises thinking that it's original, and it's not. Or everybody's had unhappy love affairs, and so they write about that. And that you have to get beyond that, get out of yourself, because if you're creating a character, that character can't be a reflection of what Greg would think. You have to think about what that character would think or do. 
And that's re what requires a lot of thought because you say, okay, if I were in this situation, what I, I would do X. And if, if you're putting yourself into every situation, the book is dull. So you have to imagine, you have to walk in the character's shoes. And that's why I don't outline too much. I have a basic idea of where I'm going with the plot, but then I try to figure it out as I'm going along. You know, if Anne Marie walks into a room, if I have a character named <laughs> Anne Marie and sees a gun lying on her friend's coffee table, what would Anne Marie do? Not what Greg would do. Nice. I know what I would do. I would probably say, uh, what's that gun doing there? But maybe you might. Maybe you're a gun person. The character is a gun person, so she picks it up and puts it in her pocketbook. I don't know. I'm making this up as I'm going along, sure. obviously. And everybody would react differently to the presence of that gun. That's interesting because, you know, you read uh, interviews or you listen to other authors, and there are some authors, particularly with a complicated mystery, who plot out mm -hmm. everything about it before they even start writing the first sentence. Yeah. You, however, let it unfold a little bit. I do. I find if I plot it out too much, then you're just following the outline. Okay. You say, okay, determine following in this example. Anne Marie picks up the gun and she puts it in her pocketbook and steals it from her neighbor and then uses it to rob a bank. And when she gets to the bank, blah, blah, blah. And then you're just executing that outline. And rather saying, well, I know she picks up the gun, I know she puts it in her pocketbook. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure where she goes from there. Okay. And then or what obstacles she confronts. Like maybe the neighbor realizes that the gun's missing and points the finger at Anne Marie, or maybe the neighbor doesn't. So how, how does the neighbor react? So in creating your characters, do you find yourself maybe consciously or unconsciously drawing from family, friends, people you meet on the streets? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know. I was a reporter for many years and I've worked in communications for a long time and I've estimated that I've probably interviewed 10 to 15,000 people over my life. I mean, I've spoken to just about any type of person in any imaginable situation. When I was a reporter, I covered fires and murders and city council meetings and investigative stuff and politicians. And my kids always say, Dad, you talk to everybody. <laughs> like I'll get into a cab and I'm, I'll talk to the cab driver, and they're like, Dad, why do you start conversations She's with people. everybody? Because I'm always interested in what people have to say. So I think I have a storehouse of that. But there's still a lot of invention that goes on because you tend to categorize people into types, and that's not a good thing to do. You know, right. the, right. Right. the brutal cop, for instance, which is a stereotype, that's not going to get you anywhere. Right. You know, the intelligent, well-read cop, there we go. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know. Good point. Okay. Um, your main character has a condition called synesthesia. Yes. Um, how did you come up with that? And how did you make it work for the character in the book? Well, I had written a book about uh, the intersection between art and marketing, like what you can learn about branding from Botticelli or marketing from Michelangelo, that sort of thing, and stumbled across in my research for that, this syndrome, condition called synesthesia, which basically means that the senses cross over. Mm -hmm. I mean, a person with synesthesia, known as a synesthete, might hear, experience a sound as a color. Okay. Or might look at this, this red cup here and suddenly taste something. So a lot of famous people had this. Uh, the French poet Rimbaud, Duke okay. Ellington, List, the composer, once said to his orchestra, gentlemen, and they were all men in those days, gentlemen, make this more blue. <laughs> and wow. so the, the musicians are probably saying, what is he talking about? How do we make classical music blue? Now, I have a touch of this myself. I don't experience sounds as colors, but I do have what's called arithmetic or mathematical synesthesia, and okay. that I see numbers as a ladder like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as a ladder going this way, zero is maybe where my shoulder is, and then the negative numbers go that way. Wow. Now, that does not help me figure out what day of the week it is. It must or, be a challenge doing calculus. <laughs> it, it can be, because I, I, I sort of do it both ways, the traditional way, but then I'll say, okay, 100 minus 7, you know, 93. And, 
some people with mathematical or arithmetic synesthesia see numbers as a spiral. So that okay. sensitivity, to, sensitivity to that, try to say that fast, yeah, right. has helped me understand this a little bit more. And one of my readers who was really perceptive said that the detective, whose name is Mazzini, that his synesthesia could be like a low-level superpower because yes. it gives him yes. insight into character. Like if I'm listening to Anne-Marie speak and I see, you know, flames coming out of her mouth, maybe that means that you're hiding some evil. Or if, you know, you, you envision, you know, a gentle babbling <laughs> brook, then you say, you know, Anne-Marie is pure of heart. It doesn't yeah. always work, and sometimes it might mislead him, but it, it right. enhances and maybe to an extent confuses his perceptions. But it definitely gives him some insights. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right, all right. Now, um, Ronan, the character, uh, has a Cambridge connection. He sure does. Um, which is kind of fun, you know, when you're reading your book, you're saying, oh, wait a minute, I know where that neighborhood is. Exactly. Um, uh, why Cambridge? Why North Cambridge? Why place him there? Well, I wanted him to come from the non-Harvard part of Cambridge because this is a guy who's extremely well-read more well-read than any five PhDs. And he grew up as a North Cambridge kid, became yep. a cop, never went to college. And also, an odd thing, I should have mentioned this earlier, this is actually the second book in the series. Oh, okay. I wrote I the know that. first book, which is about the news business. It's called Deadline on Arrival, which okay. really delves into Boston politics, Boston media, Boston locations. And then Mazzini is accepted to this art colony in this book and goes okay. north. Okay. But the first book has a lot more local color. In fact, I mentioned some local businesses well. <laughs> by name that, you know, people I know. And I said, is it all right if I mention your business? I don't know if I should say this now, but like Lawrence Hopkins, who owns Daedalus in Harvard Square. Oh, yeah, okay. Great guy. And I, I put him in there. And, you know, he seemed cool with it, so he's, yeah. he's a very nice man, and, you know, it, it's, I suppose, free advertising. Sure. I mentioned Il Casale. Okay, great. I may put you in the next one, yeah, Amber. You better I'm be nice to me. I know, I know, I know. And Joanna Chuvalis, I mean, you know, she's behind the scenes. I mean, right. you got to, you know. We'll be a pair of intrepid female detectives. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And well, so, all right, so now I'm going to have to go back and get that other book, because then that will explain more about... His whole background. Well, tell you the truth, after this came out, which was just in January, I've been so busy trying to get this to market that I haven't done any writing. But two days ago, I went back to the first book, and I hate to reread stuff that I've written. And it was just so hard to uh -oh. go through it. And there are parts of it that I liked. I said, wow, this is really good. Then other parts, it's like, no. Why no, did I do that? Why did I do that? I don't know if you have that experience. You're yes, a I do. Yes, I do. I mean, There's you go back. There's a lot of delete, delete, delete. And we should tell the audience that, you know. No, that's, that's fine. We're okay. good. <laughs> well, we, we won't go there. The, the audience knows that I do a lot of writing for the local newspaper and okay. uh, reports and whatnot. I have really exciting reports from the Capital Budget Committee in the town reports. Okay. So if, if you're looking for thrilling information, it's there. It's hidden, but it's there. Absolutely. <laughs> well, the, the best stories are in the numbers. Absolutely. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Um, okay, let's talking then a little bit more about Ronan, your main character. Sure. Tell us a little bit about his love interest. You know, I'm kind of uh, humming along in the book. And, and I don't want to give anything away, but it's there okay. is, you know, some emerging relationships. And I'm saying, mm, where's he going to go with this? Um, tell us a little bit about how you put that together. Well, it's interesting that you mention that because I frankly found love scenes the hardest of all to write. I'll tell you why. Because if it's too explicit, it begins to sound pornographic, right. which I don't want. And if it's not explicit enough, it sounds too Victorian. And actually, one of my neighbors, a woman, read the book. She read several drafts of both books. She was extraordinarily helpful. And she said, Greg, you need more here. You oh, know, wow. when they hold hands, does he feel a chill going down his spine? All right. You know, when they're flirting with each other. And how does that work? Like, you, you need to develop that a little bit more. So I yeah. thought, you know, she's absolutely right. I mean, you still have to leave something to the imagination right. because right. you don't want to be too explicit, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's 
something that Agatha would never have done. No, <laughs> you know? no, not at all. Ruth Ware, however, would. So you're in good company. There you go. I mean, Agatha could be, I mean, she could be pretty frank in a lot of the scenes, but not in that sense. No, 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 absolutely not. Not no. that I'm a Puritan about this, but you know what I mean. You don't want to get... Well, you don't want to get sidetracked, I think, in the book. I think you need to focus on exactly. you know, just the mystery and, exactly. and the characters and stuff. And then I try to imagine, like, what would he be thinking? And there were things that I did that didn't make any sense at all. Like another one of my readers, who is also a woman, said, no, 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 you know, she would never say that, Greg. That's like a male fantasy of what you would hope a woman would say. So I was going, oh, uh -oh. Man, you know, she's right. And you, you have to take a step back and show it to people, frankly, of different genders to get their reaction. Because, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm writing from a guy's perspective. Perspective, sure. And, you know, a woman has a different perspective. And, you know, my wife would say one thing, my daughter another. And you would say something else. Else. Probably, yeah, yeah. So, and you kind of say, okay, I got three different reactions. And nobody likes what I have. Right. So it's clear I need to change it somehow. <laughs> um, what I enjoy when I read a book like this is kind of the atmospherics. Right. And I think you've done a great job with the weather. Thank and the, you. And the weather becomes a character here. Yes. Becomes a focus for what happens. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about that. How do, you, how do you get to that point? And how do you, in your own head, keep saying, oh, but wait, I need more rain. Yeah, we'll try to come up with synonyms for rain and, you know, torrential downpours. <laughs> it, it's really hard because the characters, it's no secret, they're caught in the, in the middle of a terrible nor'easter. So I did research on what a nor'easter means and how unpredictable they can be. For instance, a friend of mine from New York who happens to be a lawyer, he gave me some legal advice about it. One of the characters is challenging the people who own the colony and said, why did you must have known that this nor'easter was going to come? Why did you invite us anyway? And he pointed out to me that they're very unpredictable. I mean, how many times do you see on the news it's going to be a huge blizzard, right, 25 right. inches, and yeah, this vast storm is coming toward Boston, and then at the last second it turns back to sea. These things happen, so they didn't anticipate this and the storm arrived anyway, and then you have to describe how the rain is pelting the skylights and how it's washing through the garden and how the terraces are turning into waterfalls. Mm. And there's a watchman who's pushing with a squeegee to keep the water from coming inside, inside the main chalet. And right. the colony, by the way, is made up of many chalets. There's the main chalet, and then each artist has his or her own chalet. And you think, okay, a chalet is a chalet is a chalet, right? right. Wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have no idea how many pictures of chalets I looked oh, no. at. <laughs> and that's where Google, Google Images can, can be your best friend, because right. you say, show me pictures of chalets, because some have wraparound porches, and some have small windows, and, you know, the, so the, the pitch is different. Key, yeah. You know, and, and does, the, does the roof come all the way to the ground? What's the material? You can go on forever with right, this. Right, right. Well, and the effect on the trees, because that, that mattered in the book. Exactly. What, what's, what's the tree surrounding like? What are they? How do they react to that kind of storm? Exactly. I mean, the trees become characters. Characters sort of. also. You know, the setting can become a character. The weather can become a character. Right. In fact, a, a close friend of mine, pointed something out to me. She said, you can tell the story from many points of view. And she drove me back to uh, Anna Karenina, Tolstoy's okay. novel. And there's a scene where the characters go hunting. And part of that scene is told from the point of view of the hunting dog. Oh, wow. So I reread that passage. And he just, I mean, Tolstoy was, of course, an incredible genius. But it works because the dog is mystified because the humans are being kind of foolish. So the dog is saying to herself, what are they doing? Yeah, right. they don't, do these guys know what they're doing? They, they have no idea how to run a hunt. And it works. Yeah, yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, can we ask you to do a little reading? Because sure. Because we want to sort of whet the appetite for our viewers so sure. that they'll run out and get this. Well, um, there's one part. Let me ask you what you want. Do you want to sort of set the scene in sure. the 
Well, here's... We don't want to give away too much. Okay, well, this is Mazzini. Uh, Ronan Mazzini is the main character. By the way, he's Albanian and Italian, which is what my background is like. I mean, that part of it is somewhat autobiographical. That's a whole other story about mm -hmm. how I got the name Stone, but we won't yeah, go into that. But, uh, okay, so Mazzini is, arrives, he drives up from Cambridge, he's at the, at the colony, and he says, once I was done unpacking, I put on a jacket against the afternoon chill and headed toward the main campus. There were already signs of the coming storm. A line of dark clouds was moving across the sky. Here's an example of how hard it is to describe this. As if someone were pushing a big roller of gray paint over the blue background. The gusting wind turned the leaves inside out and rustled the branches of the evergreens which shed needles that fell on my head as I walked. So I'm trying to put the reader there, right? I was heading toward a large chalet with a front wall made entirely of glass. Long copper panels ran the length of the roof with ample skylights arranged in a random pattern. A wraparound porch skirted the outside of the building. The chalet occupied a terrace etched into the side of a hill that sloped gradually toward a deep valley. On a lower terrace, gurgling fountains emptied into a pond dotted with pink water lilies. On an even lower level, white and pink asters, blue hydrangeas, marigolds, and sunflowers were so abundant that there was almost an audible harmony of colors. At least it seemed that way to me. Even someone without synesthesia would perceive music, I'll bet. I heard shimmering flutes. So that gives you an idea of how, how he thinks. And maybe I'm trying to choose stuff that's, um, that's doesn't give away too much of the plot. Here's another thing, and this is somewhat autobiographical because I do tend to, well, I'll, I'll explain in a second. So they go and visit one of the local police chiefs, and uh, he and his love interest, Mazzini and his love interest, and uh, the local police chief in a small town in Vermont says, you want to know what happened to me? And Mazzini says, yes, sir. And he says, you were once a cop, weren't you? How can you tell, I asked. By the way, the story is told in the first, first person, person from Mazzini's point of view. First of all, you've observed everything around you. Close your eyes for a minute and don't peek, the chief says. I complied. Now tell me what's in this room, son. Mazzini says, besides the floral sofa we're in and your recliner, which I'd say was made by Sears, there are two windows behind me with heavy-duty shades and lace curtains that, if you'll pardon me, look a little bit dusty. To my right, there's a bookshelf with two family pictures, one showing a pretty lady that I'll bet was your wife and the other a young couple. I'm guessing that the woman in the second picture is your daughter because she looks like her mom and the guy is her husband. They probably don't have kids yet, otherwise there'd be pictures of them too. The shelf has a couple of duck decoys, two Hemingway hardcovers, and a bunch of magazines, plus a pipe rack, a humidor, and a box of Kleenex. How am I doing so far? Yep, a cop, like I said, Haynes <laughs> said. I worked in homicide for many years, Mazzini says. So my wife always says that I observe like minute details about people. You know, if we go to a party and I say, did you see the woman who was sitting in that green chair with that really weird expression on her face? And my wife's like, Saying, who are you what are you about? talking about? How right, do you notice? Right. How do you sleep? She, my, <laughs> she and my kids always ask me. I just notice things. I can't help it. That's fine. That's Because, you know, you have to describe. The, you need detail in a book. So Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that and those local people you know, the, the law enforcement, but also the people who work in the colony, sort of the local characters, I think are very true mm -hmm. to northern New Hampshire, Vermont, those little towns, a little one-person police force, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that was, I enjoyed that because I could really relate to that. Yeah, Vermont is very, very uh, particular. It it's has a, a, a distinct personality. By the way, the cover, if you see the cover, I'll hold it up again, the, uh, the first iteration, the artist at the publisher, who's fantastic, 
she wanted to go in sort of a postcard direction with it, mm -mm. like a, a postcard of a covered bridge, for instance. Oh, okay. And I said, you know, that's not really it. That's more like a travelogue. I said, think noir, think sneaky, think scary. So she immediately came up with this, and it's perfect because it just looks, it I looks eerie. It. it is, and yet it's got, you know, the colors and the changing atmosphere. It's great. Yeah, All she right. did a wonderful job. So. Uh, what's next for you? Are you working on a third book? I am. Excellent. I actually have half of the third book written. Oh, wow. But I figured Good. I'd go back to the first one next. And my publisher said you can do them out of order. Okay. So the first one will be a prequel. Okay. And if you know anything about Star Wars, your kids are older, but... Mm. Um, you know, when my son was young, he was a Star Wars freak. Oh, yeah. Your, oh, yeah. your son probably was too. Was, yes. Well, George Lucas, the first Star Wars was number four. So he did four, five, and six. Then he went back and did one, two, and three. Right. And then he did seven. So the joke is, how does George Lucas count to ten? And the answer is four, five, six, one, two, three, three. seven. Right. But right. he made the concept of prequels acceptable so I hope people don't get confused but if anybody follows the detective from book to book maybe they want to know where he came from and how he got to this colony and yeah. and where his son came from too yes exactly yes because yes. his son is five years He's old also in, in this, this book. book right so we go back about five years and we learn about what brought him here and as I mentioned that's about the news business that book and very 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 imbued with Boston, Cambridge, local color. All right, so that'll be a lot of fun. You have to be careful. I'm sure, not too much local color that people can recognize, probably. If you talk about like Lincoln Street in Belmont, you don't want to identify a Which particular <laughs> house because then the people that live there would probably not be too happy about probably it. Probably so, not, no. So in some ways, uh, there's a Belmont Hill location in the third book and I made up a street. Okay, good, good. Just, and I checked the, check the map to make sure, sure that that street not, doesn't yeah, exist. Right. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's people, you know, people get funny about invasions of their privacy well, with good like, reason. I don't sure, knock that. Sure. I don't knock that at all. Right. Okay. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for allowing me to read this. I loved it. Thank you so much, Henry. Your questions were great, and it's, it's wonderful to meet you. I can see why you were in politics for so many years. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this has been fun. I'm Anne Marie Mahoney for Belmont Journal, interviewing Greg Stone. Um, get out there and read this.